Stand by for crime. Hi, Chuck Morgan speaking. You know, being a newscaster on a station the size of Los Angeles KOP, you're bound sooner or later to step on somebody's toes. Well, reactions are varied. The one I want to tell you about came from a man named John Hendricks, a gold mining speculator. He bought an abandoned mine up near Las Vegas on the California side of the Nevada boundary. And besides diamond drilling for a cross vein, was working some of the old drifts. This type of work has plenty of hazards. But it didn't seem to me it was hazardous enough to have three men meet their deaths on the job in as many months. Especially when I learned that each of the trio had been insured for a sizable amount, with Mr. Hendricks himself named as beneficiary. Well, I made a vague reference to this in one of my broadcasts. The next day I received a phone call from Mr. Hendricks. He insisted I visit him at the mine and then decide for myself whether my remarks were justified. Well, the next day was Saturday. So I told my blonde secretary, Carol Curtis, to pack a toothbrush and we'd spend a couple of days in the country. We started in the cool of the early morning. You know, Chuck, it was only about three months ago that we were driving along this very road. Lamapus, unless I'm wrong, which I seldom am, you're right. And unless I'm wrong, which I never am. <laughs> you promised me we were going to Las Vegas on that trip and we never got there. You're right again. Well? Well, what? Did I bring my strapless evening out for nothing this time? That depends upon what we find at the straight banana. I beg your pardon. I... <laughs> Okay, Glamorous, I should have mentioned it before. Straight Banana is the name of a mine that John Hendricks bought. There's a range of hills nearby that looks like a banana that someone straightened out. Oh, I see. Uh, like that range over there? Like that range of... Oh, I'm glad you noticed that. I'd have driven right by. What sharp eyes you have, Grandma. Hmm, there are a lot of things about me that are sharp that you never now, noticed. Now, look, don't start bragging. Uh -uh. There's a road that turns off to the mine. I'm not bragging, but a girl likes to be complimented once in a while, and you never... What was that? Sounded like a shot. And history is repeating itself. The last time we were up here, someone took a pot shot at us. Only it's different this time. We aren't the ones being shot at. Look. What's a man running as though he were being shot at? He is being shot at. As a matter of fact, he's being hit. Glamour puss, we've stepped into another one. Let's go. The man Carol and I had seen running for his life was wearing Levi's, a blue cotton shirt, and a dirty white cowboy hat. We didn't get a look at his face. As a matter of fact, we didn't get another look at him at all. By the time we'd parked the car, scrambled up the steep embankment, the area behind the boulder where he'd fallen was deserted. Well, we walked over the ridge where the ambusher had been hiding and found the same thing there. Nothing. It was uncanny. Well, Glamour Puss, what do you make of it? I'm beginning to think the whole thing was a trick of our imaginations. Say, what did they call it out here in the desert? A uh, mirage or something? Mirages don't consist of people and gunshots. Oh. Come on, let's get out of here. Okay. We went back to the car and drove on to the straight banana. The mine buildings, four and all, were stacked up against the side of a cliff. We stopped in front of what was obviously the owner's living quarters. And as we did so, the door to the building opened and a tall, gray-haired, distinguished-looking man came out. Hello there. I'm John Hendricks. I imagine you're Chuck Morgan. Yeah, that's right. This is my secretary, Carol Curtis. Hello. Mr. Curtis, it's a pleasure. I suppose you get out and come inside. It isn't much cooler, but it's better than being in this blasted sun. Have a nice trip? Yes, we, we had a fine trip. I'm afraid you misinterpreted the mention I made over the air about your mind, Mr. Hendricks. I certainly didn't intend to accuse you of being a murderer. Well, I'm glad to hear that. On the other hand, I'm not sure that I could blame you if you did. Three accidental deaths in as many months looks bad. Mm. Just how do you account for them, Mr. Hendricks? I don't. Now, this mine, as you may know, has been inactive since 1925. I spent several months studying the history of the place, maps, charts, graphs, all sorts of reports. And I'm convinced that the two veins the former owners were working meet. If I can locate the spot where they meet, I'll find a rich deposit. Yeah, so you're a diamond drilling, huh? Yes. That's not only an expensive proposition, but it requires skilled labor. Where have the accidental killings been taking place? Two in the drifts, one among the drilling crew. 
You see, all of the drifts and superstructures have partially decayed. I'm having them replaced as rapidly as possible. Is it the custom of mine owners to insure their men? Well, I don't know about the ideas of other mine owners, but I take out two policies on all of my men. Uh-huh. One for $5,000, naming the mine as beneficiary, and one for $10,000, naming the insured's family as beneficiary. Well, that seems more than fair to me. You didn't know about the policies for the insured's families, did you, Chuck? No, no. As a matter of fact, I didn't. However, I'd like to ask you, Mr. Hendricks, how the insurance company feels about all this. Uh, the company carrying my policies canceled them after the third accidental death. After a considerable amount of effort and wire pulling, I finally succeeded in getting the Intermountain Insurance Corporation to write up the business. I see. However, now I'm having trouble hiring labor. Trouble is... I have to have a good many technical men, and the best I can do at the moment is to hire bindle stiffs at an exorbitant wage. Bindle stiffs? What are bindle stiffs? Bindle stiffs are peculiar to the West, Glamour Puss. Back East, they're called hobos. Oh, where I come from, they call them bums. Well, you're not in Brooklyn now, so let's stick to bindle stiffs, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. Well, not at all, my dear. Come in, come in. Miss Curtis, Mr. Morgan, this is my daughter, Laura. Hello, Hello. Hello. Well, now, my dear, was there something in particular that you wanted to see me about? Yes, Dad. There's a man waiting in the office. He wants to see you about a job. He says he's a mining engineer. Well, this is good news. Does he uh, know about this? Yes, the... yes, I asked him. He says he doesn't care. He still wants a job. He's English, I think. Uh, I'll go talk to him at once. You two will excuse me? Certainly. Of course. Oh, thank you. Uh, Laura, why don't you make the folks a cool drink? Of course, Dad. John Hendricks went into another room and left the door ajar. His daughter disappeared into the kitchen. Glamorpus and I could plainly overhear the conversation that Hendricks had with the man who was applying for the job. Well, sir, my daughter tells me you're looking for work. That's right, Governor. I'm a mining engineer. I've got references for mine. I worked in South Africa and Alaska, too. Well, that's fine. You understand the uh, risks you'll uh, be taking if you come to work here? Why, sure, sir. That's why I came out. I think you'd be paying a real decent wage scale. <laughs> well, that's rather sharp reasoning. I doubt that we'll have any trouble over wages if your references prove you're as good a man as you'd like me to believe. Read them, sir. See for yourself. Yeah, well, let me see here. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Yes, indeed. I couldn't ask for anything better than this. Oh, I'm a good man, sir. I know all about gold mining. I didn't worry about that. You know all about it, huh? Well, that's fine. Now, I tell you what you do. See that small building over there? Oh, I do. That's the foreman's office. His name is Hal Browning. Tell him I've signed you on. And then uh, come back here. I want you to talk to my insurance company this afternoon. I have to be sitting near a window that looked out on the side of the house. The man Hendricks had been talking to came into my line of vision. He was wearing Levi's, a blue cotton shirt, and a dirty white cowboy hat. As I watched, he turned and called a reply to Hendricks' last remark. Oh, I tell, Governor, and thanks very much. This time I had a full view of his face. He wore drooping moustaches and seemed about 50 years old. I was positive he was a man Carol and I had seen shot an hour before. I'm sorry I was so long, but I'm sure you'll find these were worth waiting for. Well, they certainly look good. There you are, Miss Curtis. Mr. Morgan. Thank you. Thank you. Is Dad still talking to that engineer? No, I saw the engineer leave for the foreman's office a couple of minutes ago. Oh, excuse me. I'll go in and see what's keeping him. All right. Oh, Dad, there you are. Confounded, Laura. Where did I put the telephone number of that insurance company? If it were any closer to you, it would bite you. There it is, right on the spindle. Oh, oh yes, yes. Well, I'll have to call them. Uh, uh, tell our guests I'll be a minute longer, will you, my dear? Of course. I'm sorry. Dad's calling the insurance company. He'll only be a minute longer. Oh, that's all right. How many men do you have working here at the mine, Miss Hendricks? Uh, about 25 right now. And none of them wanted to quit after the accident? Yes, three or four did quit. Uh-huh. But Dad's paying such high wages that the rest decide to stay. I see. Well, I'm in luck. Just hired a man who seems to know his business. His name's Paul Anderson. Laura, I've made arrangements with Cranston of Intermountain Insurance Corporation to see him this afternoon and arrange for the man's physical examination. Can you drive him into Vegas? Of course, Dad. Oh, we could save you the trip if you want. We're going into Vegas. Oh, uh... no, thank you. I wouldn't miss a chance to drive into Vegas. I see what you mean. I was thinking the same thing. (laughs) Don't worry, Glamour You'll get your trip to Vegas. But first, I'd like to look around here a bit, if you don't mind, Mr. Hendricks. Well, no, not at all. Was there anything in particular that you wanted to look for? Yes, as a matter of fact, there is. Oh, what's that? A dead body. I 
Hendricks in making that crack about looking for a dead body, I wanted to see Hendricks' reaction. What did I get? Nothing. He made a joke of it, kidded me about thinking of him as a mass murderer. Glamopus and I spent an hour looking the mine over. We took an elevator to the top of the cliff and watched the diamond drill crew at work. While we were up there, we saw Laura drive out with the new employee. And I couldn't help wondering if the poor devil was going to be victim number four in the accidental death routine. Well, we looked around for about 15 minutes more, went back down in the elevator, thanked John Hendricks for his hospitality, and headed for Las Vegas. Oh, I just can't believe it. I can't either, Glamopus. You can't? You can't believe what? That those deaths are accidental. Oh, fiddly dee, of course they were. John Hendricks and his daughter were the nicest people ever. Besides, that wasn't what I meant when I said I couldn't believe it. Well, don't you want to know what I can't believe? No. I can't believe we're actually on our way to Las Vegas, Turkey Boy. Boy, are we going to have fun. Well, anyway, I'm glad I didn't mention to Hendricks about the shooting we witnessed. Hey, how about that? What were you being so coy about? Two reasons. If Hendricks is playing games, I didn't want to warn him. Secondly, was anybody actually shooting at the man in the white hat? Of course someone was. We saw it happen. Yeah, we didn't. We heard a shot, saw a man running. We saw him being hit and falling. We saw him stumble, perhaps. We didn't find his body, and I saw the guy when we were at the mine. He wasn't dead. You saw him? When? Was it the same man? He was the engineer who applied for work. I'm sure no two men in these parts would be wearing Levi's, blue cotton shirts, and dirty white hats. Oh, well, maybe we'll find out something from the insurance agent. Hold on to your bonnet, Glamour Puss. I'm going to step the old crate up to 30 miles an hour. We reached Las Vegas around 4 o'clock, and I turned Carol loose at the Desert Inn Casino with a word of caution that if she lost her shirt, she'd have to walk home. Then I got Pappy Mansfield, owner of KOP, on long distance. Told him if he was so inclined, he could, could hop a plane and come up here just to keep his eyes on the star newscaster. Well, Pappy didn't ask any questions, which was like him. Just said he'd see us around midnight. So then I found the address of the Intermountain Insurance Corporation. The office was a dinky little room over a drugstore. And Sidney Cranston, the local agent, was a dinky little man with gimlet-like eyes. Hello? You, Sidney Cranston? That's right. Want to buy some insurance? No, thanks. I just... You selling anything? No, I'm not... Then so... what do you want? If you'll stop butting in, I'll tell you. Don't get fresh, young man. I'll throw you out in your ear. You'll throw me... <laughs> All right, Cranston. I'm Chuck Morgan, newscaster in KLP in Los Angeles. I'm up here to make inquiries about those accidental deaths at the straight banana mine. Oh, then. <laughs> what about them? Well, since you're carrying the insurance, I wondered if you thought they were accidental. If I didn't, I wouldn't be carrying the insurance. But three deaths in three months... You're didn't reaching, that... son. I went over that mine with a fine-tooth comb. The shoring and the drifts and the drill derrick are as solid as a rock. Well, it implied to me that there shouldn't have been any accidents. You're reaching again. Sir? Those three deaths were coincidence. The law of averages says there won't be a fourth. And the law of the state says somebody better try to prevent a fourth. Oh, by the way, what did you think of Anderson? Anderson? Yeah, the new engineer the Hendricks hired. Oh, him... He hasn't gotten here yet. Hasn't got here? They left a half hour before we did. No, I can't help that. I've been right here all afternoon waiting for them. And I say they haven't been here. Huh. Well, there's something... Ma Sorry we're late, Mr. Cranston. Oh, hello, Mr. Morgan. Well, Miss Hendricks. And this must be Anderson, the new engineer. That's right, Governor. Paul Anderson, just down from Alaska. I'm surprised that you didn't get here ahead of Miss Curtis and me, Miss Hendricks. We left the mine a half hour later than you. Oh, we did get here ahead of you. Or I suppose we did. Oh? We've been in town a half hour or more. Mr. Anderson wanted to buy a few things, and so did I. You might have gone to my office first, young lady. Been waiting here since your dad phoned. I don't like working Saturday afternoons. Oh, I'm sorry about that, Mr. Cranston. Well, never mind. Let's get to work. You through asking dumb questions, Morgan? Yes, 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 I'm through. Only just for the record, those questions were a whole lot less dumb than you seem to think. Well, so far, I'd succeeded only in increasing my own suspicions. There were a lot of questions I wanted answers to. But right at the moment, the possibility of getting answers to any questions seemed remote. I walked over to the casino where I left Carol and found her shooting craps. She had a stack of chips in front of her that reached almost up to her chin. Come on. 
on, little Joe. Be good to Mama. Yippee, there he is. Break him over here, Charlie. Uh, no, I'll let the bundle ride. Give me the dice, Charlie. Having fun, Glamour Oh, hello, Chucky boy. Hey, look what I've been doing. Yeah, yeah, I see. You know, the smart gambler quits when he's ahead. Come on, come on, let's go. Oh, just once more, Chuck. Okay, set yourself. Roll him and see what happens. Okay, here we go. Come on, seven. <laughs> what do those two aces mean, Chucky boy? They mean snake eyes, Glamour Puss. You lose. Let's go. Oh, gee whiz. Chuck Morgan, you did that on purpose. Mm-hmm. It's all your fault. You bought me bad luck. At 3 o'clock in the morning, Las Vegas is as brightly lighted as Broadway and 42nd Street is at 8 p.m. The casinos operate 24 hours a day, as do most of the restaurants and stores. You take one look at those bright lights and wish you owned some stock in the power company that provided them. Well, at midnight, Carol and I drove out to the airport, picked up Pappy, and the three of us stopped at Sal Saggy's for a cup of coffee. Well, Chuck, I'm not going to tell you you've got a crazy idea because ever since I first heard you talking about those accidental deaths, I was inclined to go along with your theory. But what can you do about it? You haven't got a shred of evidence. I don't know, Pappy. I don't know. Seems to me it's a matter for the police. But we haven't got time for that, Glamour We're in Nevada. That means we've got to get back across the line, scare up a California deputy sheriff, sell him on the idea we aren't nuts. It might take days. And unless I miss my guess, Paul Anderson isn't long for this world. I met him at the insurance office this afternoon, and he's as ignorant as what's in store for him as I am of the fourth dimension. Well, that's pretty ignorant. Thanks. So, what do you propose to do? Pappy, I guess the three of us will have to handle this one alone. The three of us? Against those 25 cutthroats of the straight banana? Oh, they aren't all cutthroats, glamour puss. Now, look. Here's a plan that might work. In about three hours, it'll be getting light. Streaks of light were showing along the eastern horizon when I turned the old jalopy off the main highway and headed up toward the straight banana. About a mile this side of the mine, I parked and set out on foot. I kept well away from the darkened buildings of the mine, climbing to the ridge in the south where the ambush had crouched. Here I found a secluded spot and waited, smoking endless cigarettes until the sun tipped the eastern horizon and dawn crept across the desert like a benediction. Then I began my search, inching over the ground, covering every likely spot where I might find the thing for which I searched. I found it. A freshly dug hole in the ground. Beside it were three not-too-old mounds of earth. Three graves and a new one ready for its occupant. So far, so good. But my good luck ended right here. Well, Mr. Morgan, I thought newscasters slept until noon. Uh, oh. Hello, Miss Hendricks. Out for some early morning rabbit shooting? Yes. And I hope you'll be smart enough not to make like a rabbit. This rifle shoots true. These three graves testify to that fact. The occupants of the graves weren't shot, Mr. Morgan. Of course. Bullet holes would be telltale evidence. Well, you're in command. What shall I do? Dig another grave for myself? <laughs> We have more capable hands for that chore. In the meantime, let's go down and have a talk with Dad. The muzzle of Laura's rifle was an uncomfortable pressure in the small of my back as we walked down to the mine. We went directly to the owner's residence and stepped inside. Hendricks was there, and another man, Anderson. He was lying on the floor, bound and gagged, and wearing only his underclothes. The Levi's cotton shirt and dirty white hat were piled beside him. It was sight of these that gave me the answer to the big mystery with that jolt that rocked me back on my heels. Greetings, Morgan. Glad to see you gave Laura no trouble. Shooting you would have been messy. Now, don't tell me it would have bothered your conscience, Hendricks. Or do you prefer to be called Anderson? Ah, I see you've guessed the answer to our little game. Sure. At one time, you must have been an actor. Of sorts. An actor, dear fellow, of excellent reputation. Specializing in dialects, I might add. Yeah, particularly Cockney English, huh? Now, that was only one in which I was proficient. Okay, okay, Dad. Let's forget that and get this over. In a moment, my dear. 
first I must know what aroused Mr. Morgan's suspicions. That's a ham in them, Laura. Well, I'll be glad to satisfy your curiosity. The police aren't due for five minutes. How corny can you get? The police aren't due at all, and you know it. Very well, you are going to explain. To begin with, we never saw you and Anderson together at the same time. While you were hiring Anderson in the next room yesterday, you were changing into the clothes you'd taken from the poor devil an hour before. Then you passed in front of the window where I was sitting, so I'd be sure and see what you looked like. Excellent. I congratulate you, Mr. Morgan. Later, we saw Laura drive you away from the mine. But by the time we got down from the cliff, you had time to return and appear once again as Hendrix. That's why we were able to get to Las Vegas a half hour ahead of you. But you didn't expect to find me in the insurance office, did you? It was almost your undoing. A pity such brilliance can't be put to more profitable work than newscasting. Well, I prefer to live, Hendrix, as I imagine those Bindle Stiffs would have liked to live. So you figured out about them, too. Bindle Stiffs usually have obscure backgrounds, don't they? No one would be likely to know if one died or had been murdered. That's why you always selected one of approximately your own size, dressed yourself in his clothes, and played the role of Cockney, French-Canadian, or any other character of which you were proficient. Then you merely redressed the bindle stiff in his own clothes and let the accident occur. Which is exactly what I'm going to do now. Laura, keep him covered. Don't worry. Hurry it up. I waited until Hendricks had his prisoner almost completely untied, then walked deliberately over to the window and waved. Keep away from that window. Don't forget that bullets leave telltale holes, Laura. He gave some sort of signal. Someone's up in the ridge. Give me that rifle. All right, Anderson, let's get him. Come on, man. Oh, this... <laughs> well, Paul Anderson had presence enough of mind to give me the help I hoped would be forthcoming. It was Carol who'd fired the shot. Pappy was waiting outside, and he was in on the fight like a Marine. We found a sheriff after considerable search, turned our prisoners over, told him our story. And then Carol and I persuaded Pappy to ride back to L.A. with us in the jalopy. But how about the man we saw being shot at, Chuck? Was that Anderson? It was Anderson. The ambusher was on the ridge. He couldn't see our car, but he could see Anderson. He shot over Anderson's head. Anderson took cover... And behind the boulder, there was a second man waiting for him. That was so there'd be no bullet holes when the dead bodies were examined, eh? Right. Now, about the second insurance policy, the one made out to the deceased family. You know, I have a hunch, Pappy, that Hendrick's organization was pretty far-reaching. The families were probably plants who took the money and split it with the Hendricks. Hmm, well, that makes sense. Say, Chuck. Yeah? How long have you owned this car? Oh, Pappy, I'm glad you asked that question. It's so old that the record of its birth was lost before the war. Oh, the... I thought so. Pappy, getting you to ride back with us was a trick. He thinks you'll take pity on him and buy him a new car. As a matter of fact... Oh! It might not be a bad idea. Oh, hold it. My, were those bumps or did a wheel fall off? You see, Pappy, I knew if you were made aware of the crate your star newscaster was forced to ride around in, you'd want to buy me a new one. Yeah, well, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll make you a deal. Good. What's that? If you let me off at the next town so I can catch a train for the rest of this trip, I'll buy you one. Oh. 